All right, uh, so I'm Paul Bruffett. I'm the um, data and analytics architect for Devon Energy. So I'm on the data and analytics platform team and we build um, distributed um, cloud native platforms for doing data and analytics, basically. Uh, so I'm gonna talk uh, about our experience with distributed deep learning. Uh, so uh, how many folks have used Spark? Any, anybody, anybody use Spark? Couple, couple. TensorFlow? Same, similar, couple, all right. So I'm gonna be talking about Spark and TensorFlow. Uh, the good news is if you haven't used them, I'm not gonna be going through any code. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'm gonna be talking about them. So I'll, I'll kinda level set based on that. So a little bit about deep learning, right? Deep learning is the use of neural networks to build predictive models. We give it data, it learns from that data, and it makes predictions, right? Pretty simple. Uh, these networks can be distributed across GPUs either to reduce training time or to support larger models. And so if you think about it, uh, we obviously use GPUs for deep learning because it's a lot of linear algebra, and GPUs are great at linear algebra. Uh, several orders of magnitude faster than CPUs, right? The challenge with GPUs, they have a finite amount of memory, and so even like the P100s, the NVIDIA's uh, new deep learning chips have 16 gigs of memory, which means as you get very large networks, right, you end up with a very sophisticated network that has a lot of parameters, you run out of memory, because all of those parameters have to be kept on the GPU's memory, right? And so what you find, especially with a certain type of neural network for image recognition or video, uh, you run out of memory very quickly, right? With, especially with the very sophisticated, very deep models that are hundreds of layers, um, you run out of memory. And so we're interested in distributing across GPUs so we can do even larger models, right? Or if you have uh, millions or billions of training examples, right, of pieces of data that you want your model to learn from, we're interested in doing that in parallel because otherwise it can take weeks, right? And so it, when Microsoft did one of the leading um, image recognition architectures, I think it took them two weeks to train across a cluster of GPUs, right? And so that's pretty painful and you wanna be able to add more and scale uh, linearly with your GPUs, right? All right, so let's talk a little bit about Spark then to level set. Uh, so we use Spark at Devon for distributed transformation. So Spark is the successor to MapReduce. MapReduce was kind of the original distributed, mass market distributed, um, processing framework it, based on a white paper from Google. And what it did is allowed you to take these massive data sets and manipulate them, right, and transform them. You do a map, which means apply a function to all of the things, and then reduce to aggregate your results back, right? That's, that's map and reduce. It was very slow, though. MapReduce is very slow, because every time it reads from disk, it writes to disk, and you want to do another transform? Okay, read and write, right? And so it'd take hours. Facebook would do these transform pipelines that took all night, right, um, or longer. And so folks at Berkeley came up with this idea of Spark where basically, okay, let's do the transforms, but let's do it all in memory. And so what Spark does, it builds what's called an execution graph. And so you specify an operator to say, well, I wanna filter the data, right? Or I want to count the data. And it builds all these actions in a graph until you tell it to do something like save it, show it, uh, the data, right? And then it executes that whole graph. It does it all in memory across a cluster. And so at Devon, we use uh, what's called Azure Databricks. It's a, it's a service for Spark from the, basically the guys that uh, started it at Berkeley. Um, and it allows us to do transforms on massive data sets. And so we have data sets that you know, are, are billions of records. I think you know, one, of our, one of our data sets I've been doing a lot of work with is 48 billion records uh, of subsurface readings. And so you can't really do that. We store it in Oracle, but you can't do any bulk analysis on it in an Oracle database, right? It's just too much data. And so we have Spark clusters that can be, in some cases, you know, have hundreds of CPU cores and terabytes of memory that we stand up, we do our analysis, and then we give them back. We tear it down, right? And we pay by the hour because it's the cloud. Uh, and so Spark is great for that. We, we do uh, distributed transforms. Um, we primarily use Scala, so the programming language Scala for streaming data transforms, because Scala is actually the language that uh, Spark is written in. Uh, it's a Java-based, uh, it's a Java variant, Scala. Uh, and then Python for data science. So Python has obviously taken, taken over the world for data science, right? And so we use what's called PySpark, which are the Spark APIs uh, to do data science. And so we make an end-to-end -end data transform pipeline in Spark using Python. Our Spark, yeah, so I talked about Databricks. Uh, the, uh, the great thing about Databricks, cause so we've had a Cloudera cluster, Cloudera CDH, um, on-premise for five or six years. Uh, and it's very useful, we've gotten a lot of value out of it, but it obviously doesn't auto scale because it's in our data center next to the airport, right? And so if we want a really big job, well, we may displace other jobs. The nice thing about Databricks is we basically just get clusters on demand and as soon as they're done, we turn them off, right? And it'd be prohibitively expensive to do that otherwise because we do a lot of like subsurface calculations for predicting the drill bits position, for example, on Databricks uh, in the cloud. 
uh, that would have probably cost us $700,000 to buy the hardware for, right? But instead we pay hourly, and if we have more wells, we pay more hours, which is obviously good because we have more wells. And if we have fewer wells, well, we pay for fewer hours, right? So it auto scales with us, and we don't have to manage that. If our, if our load needs more cores, we get more cores automatically, and the cluster scales itself. So we like Databricks very much for that. Uh, any, any questions on any of that so far? I know I just kind of, yeah, dived in. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what I was saying we do with the Scala. And so Spark Streaming, we do um, streaming data transforms on logs, on prim primarily like machine logs, like actual telemetry from servers like Active Directory and firewalls and network uh, equipment. And we use uh, Kafka, we stream all that into Kafka, and then we use Spark Streaming to pick it up as it comes in and do transforms, predominantly enrichment to say, this user ID is this user, so I'll connect their user information, right? And then we write it out to Elasticsearch in that case. And it allows us to scale massively because we get, I don't even know how many terabytes of logs a day, right? Because we instrumented all of our network. Yeah, so any other questions? Okay, all right. Feel free to, feel free to stop me, right? Because I'll just keep going. Um, all right, so deep learning. So I talked about distribution, right? We use Spark to do distribution of like transforms of algorithms. We basically distribute our algorithms with Spark. Um, we, we do deep learning with TensorFlow. So we've got TensorFlow and Keras that we use the most extensively. And so TensorFlow has been around a while, right? It's the Google open source project that really took off for deep learning and made deep learning much more uh, popular and accessible, right? It kind of popularized, in, in my mind, deep learning, or at least it coincided with it. Um, PyTorch has actually gained a lot of popularity. So Facebook made a, a PyTorch, which is a competitor to TensorFlow. And if you're not familiar with it, PyTorch has gained uh, a lot of popularity in academia. So it's much more, if you've used TensorFlow, TensorFlow is not actually that Pythonic, right? It has its own set of operators, and it uses a graph, and it does its own execution in a session. Like, it's got all these operators which are very unique to TensorFlow, right? But it's not, you can't use regular Python with it. Like, you don't do loops, right? Um, and so you have to instantiate all your code as TensorFlow code, which is basically like matrix linear algebra. Um, so it's kind of hard to learn. If you know Python, you don't know TensorFlow, right? Um, and, and so PyTorch is different, though. PyTorch, it actually uses a lot more of the operators from Python. So like you, you instantiate your neural networks as classes, as Python classes with, with PyTorch, and you can loop through to train PyTorch, right? And so you can basically, um, really all PyTorch gives you are some primitives that really help you make Python code that turns into deep neural networks. And so it's become very popular because it's much easier to sort of pick up and so there are some very sophisticated things like differential learning rates that are very easy to express in PyTorch and very hard to express in TensorFlow. And so sort of the, some of the cutting edge research has been much easier for, for folks to, to put in there. And so PyTorch has started gaining traction at Devon as a result, right? Um, but TensorFlow has the most enterprise tooling like TensorFlow Serving and TensorBoard and they have mobile deployment solutions. And so you kind of have this tension, right, about enterprise supportability on the TensorFlow side because it's been around longer with with sort of uh, the community sort of coalescing around PyTorch. And so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. But I'm predominantly going to be talking about TensorFlow because it has integration with Spark. Yeah. In your view, what would be the most optimal for operationalize throughout the enterprise when you deploy the models? Well, so if your use case requires deployment to like edge devices like mobile devices, then TensorFlow is going to win right now. Facebook is working to merge in um, their, other their other deep learning libraries to PyTorch and make it more competitive, but you're going to get much more in the way of enterprise grade tooling with TensorFlow. You have to do a lot more of that yourself with PyTorch, right? Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. All right. So distributed deep learning. So distributed deep learning can solve one or both of the problems I articulated earlier, right? I want a bigger network, right, with more parameters, so I want to distribute across GPUs, or I want to reduce my training time with parallelism. Basically, I want to take a massive data set with hundreds of millions of samples, I want to break it into chunks, give it to different GPUs, I want them all to run in parallel, and then I want to average the results, right, and then do it again, and then do it again. And so you, you can get near linear um, reductions in training time with more GPUs with, with the solution I'm going to talk about. Um, so with massive data sets, complex models, it can take day or weeks on a single GPU, right? I already alluded to that. Um, nothing new here. Challenges to distribution, though. So TensorFlow supports uh, distribution of models, but if, if you think TensorFlow is complex, distributed TensorFlow is much more complex. So now, all of a sudden, you have to deal with workers, parameter servers, and new operators to manage the two. Right? And so you basically have to have pieces of your infrastructure that manage the parameters for all your different workers. You have to govern that. And it's 
really hard to debug. And you can't just take the code that you've developed, right? You say, I've got this TensorFlow model, I like it, it works. I wanna run it on 50 GPUs now, right? Now you have to refactor it. You have to rewrite it, basically, to tell it to use these GPUs to average parameters. It's very complicated. And because you're running it across this cluster and doesn't have uh, like a unified logging or monitoring or anything, it can fail on any of those tasks and then it's really hard to see why it failed, right? Because it failed on GPU 49, but you don't see sort of one pane of glass to say, well, here's the error from GPU 49. You have to do that yourself, right? And so it's very difficult. The other thing that Uber found is that you lost a huge amount of performance as you scaled. So this is from Uber's um, engineering blog. And what you see is the orange is how much performance they got in the real world, and that sort of white that's above it is how much performance they should have gotten if it scaled linearly. So they went from one to 128 GPUs, and they basically found, you can see, that they started losing 50% of their performance by 128. And if you've had to rent or buy NVIDIA's deep learning GPUs, you know that's a huge amount of money, right? Because these things are very expensive. Uh, and so that, that kind of made it a non-starter. And so th these are due just two different architectures, two different image recognition architectures. And so they said, okay, well, we need to improve that, right? So Uber said, all right, here's the problem. We want to make uh, an open source library to solve that problem. So they made Horovod. And so Horovod wraps TensorFlow or PyTorch and basically parallelizes them both with minimal code modifications. And so it works by using something called all reduce, which is basically a form of broadcasting and averaging what are called gradients in this case. So deep learning is a bunch of these matrices and it develops these gradients to say how correct or incorrect am I. And then we, we take those across all those different GPUs, we average them together using all reduce, and then we broadcast them and then we start the next iteration. That's basically how it works. This is from, like Baidu developed the, um, the optimum version of all reduce and then Uber just implemented that in open source is kind of how that worked. And so this, the, the beauty of Horovod is though you don't have to know anything about what I just talked about, right? You wrap your TensorFlow or your PyTorch code in a Horovod wrapper, right, in their API, and then it takes care of all that. It says, okay, you got this many GPUs, I'm gonna distribute the parameters, I'm gonna distribute the learning, and that's all automatically done behind the scenes without worrying about parameter servers or workers or any of that stuff. So Horovod's very popular right now uh, for, for distributed deep learning. So I talked about Spark, I've talked about distributed uh, deep learning, but now what we said is, well, we did all the transformations in Spark, and we're doing our deep learning on basically GPU VMs, right, with Horovod to distribute deep learning. Now I wanna take Spark and I wanna connect it directly to Horovod, right? I wanna basically be able to make this in-memory transformed data set, and I'm gonna feed it right into my machine learning model. And so Databricks has customized Horovod to, it, to accept Spark data frames. So that's basically how it works, right? You take all your data, you transform it in memory with Spark, so in our case, we were doing it with unstructured documents, with invoices, so we get a tremendous number of invoices at Devon, right? All of our folks, um, all of our vendors out in the field email us invoices for the work that they've done. And we have people actually go and key them into SAP so that we'll pay them, right? Which we have a lot of people to do that, and we're trying to automate a portion of that, which means we need to use machine learning to extract things like the date, the WBS number, the line items, the quantities, right? And the total is very important, right? And so we have millions of historic invoices in SAP that we have the data for, so we said, well, let's enrich the data in Spark, turn it all into vectors, right? Because it's unstructured, it's semi-structured, but it looks unstructured. Um, and, uh, and so we use Spark to load all those, right, to vectorize them, basically to turn all the words into numbers so a machine learning algorithm can use them. And then to give the target, right? And so we do all the, the transformation, the vectorization, and any feature engineering, right? In, in Spark, and then we feed that directly into TensorFlow and we train a model on it, all in the Databricks platform uh, using open source technologies. So what we're really interested in on this model is not so much the model-like distribution uh, for, for larger models, because this is a fairly simple recurrent neural network, but we're interested in, because we have so much data, of, we're interested in training faster, and so we distribute this across the Databricks cluster to run multiple copies of the training data. So each reads what's called a partition of the data, and so on a reasonably large cluster, we'll have 200 or more partitions. Executes the model against it, calculates the gradients, basically says, hey, here's how incorrect I am. So modify all the matrices in the deep learning. That's, that's really how deep learning models work, is by a bunch of these matrices. Modify all the matrices to be a little closer to what it should be, right? And then average that together and try again, right? But we do this across 200 partitions simultaneously, and so we can train a fairly sophisticated model in an hour on millions of invoices. So that's the power of this, of this approach, right? Um, all right, so, so we run multiple copies of the training script, we average the gradients, we update the model, and we repeat. And we repeat for as many times as we want until our model starts overfitting, basically. Good? 
Okay, so I mentioned the ring all reduce, and so Horovod, it, it, it distributes all the parameters, right, and it averages the parameters and it brings them back together. So Baidu pioneered this approach for distributing parameters among nodes, um, and, and each node passes the gradients to the other using a bandwidth optimal strategy. So at the end of the day, basically, uh, NVIDIA implemented this in their library and Horovod, or Uber just used it, right? But what they found is that so using this NCCL, which now it's actually NCCL v2, it's I think it's NVIDIA Common Core Library or something like that. It's basically all the core algorithms that NVIDIA has implemented. And this, this kind of thing is really NVIDIA's competitive advantage. It's more, it's not so much that AMD GPUs can't do what NVIDIA's do, it's that NVIDIA's written a rich set of APIs, libraries, and interfaces that make it much easier to do things on their, on their platform, right? And so they've kind of built this wall of code around their, around their platform to entrench themselves, and they've been very effective at it, to be honest. Um, anyway, so hence Horovod. So, so the reason for the name Horovod is because they take all these parameters and they broadcast all these parameters around and basically average the gradients across all your, across all your partitions, bring them back together and then distribute them. And so they named it Horovod because that's a traditional Russian folk dance in which performers link arms in a circle, right? And so that's kind of the, you know, that's the genesis of the name for the open source library. Um, all right, so by combining Spark with ten Horovod on TensorFlow, we can train large networks on arbitrarily large data sets. So the problem that we were having, um, even with Horovod, right? So we were using Horovod previously um, on distributed clusters of GPUs, but you can't load all that data in memory. And so you have to do a bunch of Python code now to load batches, basically, because we can't load six million or more invoices of unstructured data into a Pandas data frame, right? It, it'll stop after four gigs. It's just a limit of the technology. And so previously we were having to do a bunch of weird work to basically load batches of data from disk or from shared like backing storage like HDFS and train on it and then manage sort of that concurrency. And we ended up spending as much time sort of because we couldn't just bring all the data in memory lazily, right? Managing all this code as we were making our network, right? And so what we said is well with Spark we'll just get a bigger cluster, right? And so we can just bring it all into memory and use an arbitrarily large data set is how I express that, right? We could make our data set as large as we wanted to, and if we started to run out of memory, we just built a bigger cluster, which is fine, right? Because to the extent we need more data, we can obviously afford to pay more to process that data. Did you have a question? Just to, I don't want to jump around. No, that's fine. So yeah, you can, so, so first off, you know, I've been talking about the productized version of Spark, right? But it's, it's sort of like Linux and Red Hat though, right? Like you can, run, you can run Spark without Databricks, and most folks do. Most Spark distributions have nothing to do with Databricks. And so it's a completely open source platform, Spark, and it can run on most anything. You, you should really run it on Linux. If it can run Linux, then you can probably put Spark on it. Um, obviously it wouldn't make sense for, you know, really tiny edge devices, but you can. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, you can run Spark completely open source. You could run all of this, um, except maybe the custom version of Horovod. I think that, I think that may or may not be open source. So, so Databricks open source is the core platform, but then kind of starts to enrich that platform, if that makes sense. And some of those enrichments are not always open source, right? But the core Spark platform is. And so the nice thing about Spark, if you've ever done distributed computing before, is the APIs are very easy. So they've made it easier and easier every time that they've built a solution. And so now they actually have like Spark SQL. And so we've got folks in Databricks that don't know Python and they're writing SQL, but that SQL compiles down to Spark and gets distributed across the cluster. Um, you can also express commands sort of syntactically similar to SQL now with you know, uh, a Spark data frame group by or select or a sum or an, you know, whatever it is. So it's, it's not an, uh, actually as, as daunting or challenging to learn uh, Spark as it was for some other like previous generation languages. It can still be very odd to combine Spark with like standard Python though, just because the logging is very bad for, the, for writing Python functions and Spark functions, but that's probably not here or there, it just we spent a lot of time on that. But now, we, well now we're, I think we're good. Um, any, other, any other questions? Okay, 
so we have combined our scale out pre-processing pipelines with deep learning jobs in one platform and code base. What that means is we take it, you know, so what it means is we take all of our data, we take the raw data, right, and we've defined the entire pre-processing pipeline in, what, in what's called a notebook, right? And so this is, uh, uh, Databricks works as data science notebooks is what they are, which you should be familiar with from things like Jupyter, right? Um, it's very similar to Jupyter. They just modified it to be uh, theirs, basically. Um, and so we have one notebook that loads the data, it pre-processes them all, it uh, stages them for deep learning and then actually executes the model in one, in one long notebook that, you know, if we run start to finish, takes probably two hours. Uh, so that's very helpful, though, because what we don't have to do anymore is say, okay, now I want to modify my feature engineering, right? I want to add a new feature. Maybe I want to add the length of the word that I didn't have. I take that one notebook, I modify part of it, and then I can execute the whole thing instead of saying, well, I've got to go upstream to my feature part, engineering pipeline and modify that and then save the data back out and then load it back to my deep learning cluster, right? Because that's how you have to do it otherwise. Um, so that's very convenient from a sort of a cycle time. We cycled on these um, deep learning models much faster than we would have in the past. Uh, it then, then it partitions the data, so I talked about that. So that's how, that's a fundamental construct of Spark if you're not familiar with it. So for larger clusters, Spark makes more partitions, right? That's basically how it works. You get more cluster, you get more partitions. Smaller cluster, fewer partitions. That's, that's kind of the deal. You can specify things about those partitions, like how much memory they have, how many CPU cores they have. But with Databricks, we don't really worry about that. It does it automatically pretty intelligently for us. Um, so it partitions the data across the cluster and supports GPU and CPU clusters. So that's the other side of it, too, is we can actually make Databricks GPU clusters with as many GPUs as we want to pay for that will do our processing and then our deep learning and, and split the partitions across the GPUs for us is, is basically what that boils down to. Currently, only TensorFlow is supported in conjunction with Horovod on Spark although PyTorch is supported by Horovod. So if you say, I want to use Spark, I want to do that nice stuff that you talked about, right, with my pre-processing pipelines, you have to use TensorFlow. So that's why we kind of went back to TensorFlow. We developed a lot of technical acumen with TensorFlow, got more traction with PyTorch, and then kind of said, oh, we really want this integration, and then kind of had to go back to TensorFlow, which is fine, and I'll talk about, um, I'll talk about how that'll change, hopefully, in the not too distant future, um, but right now that's where you're at. There are also some limiting factors that I'll talk about um, with sort of that, that integration that we're still working through. So key use cases. So this scale out power has been the most useful for unstructured analytics. What I mean by that is most of our structured data we can bring into memory on a, on a node, right? So if we're using the, what are called the in series on Azure, those are their GPU VMs, they come with 56 gigs of memory by default, right, for the smallest. And so we can put most of our structured data in memory on that machine, right? Python will hold a lot of structured data um, because it compresses very well in memory. It can hold a lot of structured data in memory. It's when we start talking about unstructured data or semi-structured and unique data, like um, if you're familiar with the oil and gas space, you'll know that seismic data is segy data, and it's a binary format that is just massive. I mean, we'll have multi-terabyte uh, seismic shoots where we'll get a segy file that's most several terabytes. You obviously can't see it pre-stack. That's pre-stack as opposed to post-stack where they've compressed, done some dimensionality reduction. Uh, then, then we're talking gigabytes, but that's still a lot of data for one seismic file, right? And so we can't really do that either, and that's kind of a, a structured format, but it's its own format. So this has been really useful for unstructured data like image recognition, um, like I talked about with, with either processing all of our invoices or all of our well files or leases. We have a tremendous amount of unstructured data, several petabytes of unstructured data. And so that's, that's where we need to unlock this. Even our largest structured data sets are usually single digit terabytes. Um, uh, training networks to classify document types. So we've had two really successful use cases so far, like I talked about with invoice extraction, and then also auto classifying documents, right? We want to take a document, I want to tell you what it is. Is it a lease, is it a well file, is it an invoice, right? Because like I said, we have literally petabytes of this data and they're either out on SharePoint or out on network drives or on people's desktops. We want to be able to aggregate all that data and tell you what's out where. And so automatically classifying is, is uh, hugely useful and we have to use this distributed deep learning to develop at all predictive models for that. Uh, I already talked about the invoices. Potential for subsurface data formats like SegWi and images. It's actually interesting because I, I wrote this and then I saw two weeks ago there's a Kaggle competition for um, salt in subsurface, basically taking um, seismic data like I was talking about. They've converted it to images so you see all the subsurface stuff in, in a PNG and then identifying formation pieces in that basically. 
And so it's brought all these um, uh, libraries from Shell and folks like that up to the front as people have done this due diligence on this Kaggle competition. And so you're finding a, kind of a lot of interesting things bubbling up to the top uh, for, for geoscience um, uh, deep learning as, as that's kind of taken off. Because honestly, there really hasn't been a Kaggle competition that was oil and gas. The others have been like Iceberg for stat oil, which isn't very oil and gas, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm curious to see how that one ends up going. Uh, then additional complexity of Spark and TensorFlow on Spark hasn't been worth, oh yeah, so this is what I talked about. So we can load traditional structured data in memory. And so we haven't done this kind of additional complexity of Spark engineering and TensorFlow on Spark for saying, well, you know, I want to take uh, gamma reading and I want to start predicting, you know, um, resistivity, right? Which is, a, which is a use case. Or I want to fill in missing gamma readings from other wells and train a model to do that. We, we're not using TensorFlow and Spark for that because it's, it's kind of like taking a sledgehammer to a thing that we just, we just need a regular hammer for, right? Um, and so for kind of structured deep learning, it's, it's not been necessary to, to kind of adopt this sort of power, power technology approach. So I talked about, I, I referred to the challenges, um, but now I'm gonna dig into them. So TensorFlow on Spark with Horovod is fairly immature. So Horovod's only been around for a couple months, maybe a year. TensorFlow's been around for what, three, kind of the old man now. And then PyTorch has only really hit its stride in the last maybe year. And so a lot of these technologies are relatively new with TensorFlow being the oldest and most mature. And so TensorFlow on Spark with Horovod, basically combining TensorFlow with Spark with Horovod, that's a, that, that three-way union is a fairly new thing, as in a couple months old. Um, and so it's fairly immature. Uh, in TensorFlow, whenever you build models, there's a type of model that's called an estimator. You have to use an estimator with TensorFlow and Spark, which means that you're inherently limited in the structure of model you build, not the complexity of the model. You can build very complex models as estimators but you're inherently limited in the APIs you have to use is what that means. Um, the challenge is we have specific requirements in our models like embeddings layers. So if you're familiar with um, deep learning on um, words, embeddings are basically how you look up the vector representation of the word, right? And so I can't pass a neural network the word the, right? Or the word man or the word woman. I can't pass those to a neural network. I have to pass numbers, right? Presumably floating point numbers. And so what vectors do is they take those words and they represent them as vectors. They represent them as a one by uh, 100 or, or 200 or 300 are the most common. 100 is the most useful uh, vector, right? And they've trained them so that that representation is actually indicative of the word, right? So, so woman and queen are more similar than man and king, right? And so you see that kind of syntactic representation in the vector. Um, which is very interesting, but we have to use embedding layers to look up the vector, right? So we take a word and an embedding layer in your neural network says, oh, I see the word, here's what vector representation. I see this word, here's the vector representation. It's a lookup matrix, is what it is. Well, we can't use that with the TensorFlow on Spark and initialize it, so we have to do all these weird workarounds. So that's a huge pain in the butt. Um, specific set of types of data are supported, so this has been a huge pain too, right? Float and long uh, are supported. Double is not supported. And so you have to do weird workarounds because for whatever reason, PySpark really likes to make things double. And so now I have to go and convert it to float, and sometimes I run out of memory, and uh, you know, we spend a lot of time on that. Uh, and then it's difficult or impossible to implement callbacks. So if you're familiar with Keras, it has a thing called callbacks. And what callbacks allow you to do are log out your model parameters, right? And so you automatically log out to say, here's my epoch, here's my accuracy, here's my epoch, here's my loss, here's my epoch, here's my weights, right? And you, then you get a nice board that shows you your training and your fit, right, called TensorBoard. Great. And so callbacks and cares do that almost automatically for you. You can also do things like stopping early, where you say, I want to do 300 epochs, but if my validation loss doesn't get better for five, then just stop, right? Save me some time, because uh, I've obviously started to overfit. Uh, and then also um, saving the best model weights. That's actually probably been the biggest, where I can d basically tell it, save the model version, right, that has the best uh, accuracy on my validation data set. And I can do that with a Keras callback. I can't do that at all with TensorFlow and Spark. I have to save every model and then go find out which was the best one myself. So you can tell I'm a little bit frustrated about that. And then error messages are ambiguous. So this is, I mean, if you're familiar with Python and you basically try to use PySpark, you'll find that this is the case for everything, right? And so a little bit about PySpark is you can take arbitrary Python code, like you can write a Python function, and you can wrap it in a UDF, a user-defined function, and then you can call it in Spark, which is amazing. You basically say, I'm gonna give you these things, you perform this whatever Python code, I don't care, right? It doesn't have, it's in no way Spark, and it automatically parallelizes that for you across your data set and runs it in tandem, right? 
And so I take it, I take a Python function, I register it as a UDF, a user defined function, and then call it in Spark, right? And so you, you have to do that in order to get anywhere with this kind of work because there aren't automatic Spark things to do what you need in deep learning, right? Well, the problem is whenever you have a, you, you have an error, you get like Java null language pointer error, right? And you're like, well, I don't even know what that means because it's not a Python error, right? So how do I debug that? And, you know, it probably meant you had a mismatched data type, which is a really helpful for debugging that, right? Um, so anyway, the error messages are very ambiguous. So you spend a lot of time becoming a, kind of a Spark expert and a Horovod on Spark expert, uh, which isn't to say it's not worth it because we did it, right? I mean, we've, we've spent a lot of time on it and gotten a tremendous amount of value out of it, but it's to say it's frustrating. The other thing that I haven't, uh, that I didn't put on this slide that's a huge pain also is sometimes with your model, you think about, right, sending features to your model, right? You basically say, here are the things that I want you to learn from. In this case, obviously, it'd be predominantly the words. It'd be the vector representation of the words in the invoice. But the other thing you may want to do is say, well, I want to feed it just a Boolean of is this thing a number or not, right? Or the length of the word. Or I want to do these other features, right, which may be indicative of the data, but that aren't captured in the vector because obviously that gets lost because every vector is the same length and numbers are probably gonna be zero vectors because they're not words with representations, right? And so whenever you wanna do that, it's actually fairly easy to do that in Keras. In Keras, you can tell your model, I wanna accept one thing, five things, whatever you wanna do, you can accept them at any layer of your neural network. It's very easy. It's very difficult here. You can only pass one set of features, and so we end up doing weird things like appending all of the features and then doing slicing of matrices in order to basically like extract them from each other which is very odd and it makes you think a lot about matrix um, processing when you're, that's not adding any value, right? And so it's kind of a limitation right now that, uh, that you can't pass multiple sets of features to what's called the, the Spark Horvath estimator. And I'll say that Databricks is doing a huge amount of work on it and we're going talking to a mountain regimen next week and so I may be beating him up completely unfairly about this, but it has taken us months to get through some of that, right? To slog through it. Um, and so kind of the good about that, as I've said, well, there's some challenges, right? It works, and it works great for, for use cases that necessitate sort of, again, distributed deep learning. Um, but uh, Databricks announced something at their most recent conference out in San Francisco called Project Hydrogen, which is an enhancement to Spark. And so the way Spark works is Spark, um, the, way they, the way it's described is Spark takes uh, processing, like I talked about transformations, and it makes them sort of embarrassingly parallel is, is the way that Databricks articulates that. And what that really means is it partitions it up and then it executes the stuff on each partition simultaneously and then it brings all the results back together for you, right? And so if you have twice as much data, you get twice as many partitions if you get a cluster that's bigger, right? So it's embarrassingly parallel in that you can have massive data sets and massive clusters. I mean, we run some of our Spark clusters with four terabytes of memory and over a thousand CPUs, right? And so you get stuff done pretty fast that way. But the problem is, is with Spark, the kind of inherent thing about its scheduler is if a task fails, it tries to re rerun that task. And so if one Spark task fails, it says, well, maybe my executor died, right? Maybe the node died. Well, I don't want to fail the job because a node died. I want to rerun the job. I want to rerun that part of the job, right? Because you've got literally sometimes in your jobs, you've got thousands of tasks that run across the partitions and you don't want to rerun all thousand because a, a node died because that happens all the time. And so that doesn't actually work for deep learning though. Deep learning uh, has, is, is more of a concept of what they call gang scheduling, which basically means if any task fails, the whole job fails. And that's how deep learning works today, which is what makes it so hard to use with Spark. Because Spark says, well, I want to rerun everything, but your deep learning models and frameworks say, well, no, I don't want you to do that because if it failed, it probably failed for a reason and I want you to make them do it again, basically. And so they're combining, they're basically taking Spark and adding a new scheduling type. In addition to the parallel scheduler, which is what's out there now, they're adding a gang scheduler. And so what it'll do, the idea, is it'll take all your processing and then you'll basically say, okay, now switch over to the gang scheduler, run my neural network, and then probably switch back to the parallel one to make my predictions, right? And so the power of that, that, that is ostensibly it, is you'll basically take it and you'll be able to transmute every partition of your data frame to a pandas data frame without bringing them all back. Because today you can do that, but it brings it all back into the driver, which means it brings it all back into one machine, which means you run out of memory and it takes a very long time, right? So the idea of this is it'll, it'll decouple to support Python code in parallel by converting each partition and synchronizing the execution. What that means at, at the end of the day is basically I'll be able to take whatever framework I want, PyTorch, TensorFlow, Cafe, right? Whatever, whatever uh, can run with, with Python bindings, I'll be able to do all the heavy lifting up front with Spark 
basically tell it to switch over, run some Python code, and then switch back to Spark, right? That's the idea. And so Project Hydrogen should make it much easier to develop these types of integrated distribution and distributed deep learning pipelines that I've talked about. Should make it much more consumable. Because right now it's kind of, I would consider uh, Spark with deep learning to be sort of on the leading edge, right? Yahoo developed a solution a year or so ago, but it didn't really take off outside of Yahoo, uh, to my knowledge. Um, and so now this has kind of started, and now you see more companies, right, Salesforce and some other larger companies adopting this, this distributed deep learning with Horvat and Spark and TensorFlow. And so my hope is that this last generation, this, this sort of third generation approach, right, with Project Hydrogen will make it easier for, for more average companies, right, to be successful with this um, and make it less painful for, for you to develop technical solutions. That's what I got. Okay. Okay. So I'm, any, any questions about any of that or any of the other stuff I may or may not have talked about? Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the way that we uh, do it right now is, so, so if I think about our pre-processing pipeline, what we did is we didn't get any data about those invoices except what was keyed into SAP. So we basically got the, an image, a PNG or a PDF of the invoice, and then we got whatever a human put into SAP, right? And so what we had to do is we had to OCR it first, right, at scale. And so we actually wrote a bunch of Databricks code that went against the Azure Cognitive APIs. And what those give you is a nice OCR result that also includes the bounding box at which it found the data, which I think will be really helpful for some of our models because total, invoice total is gonna to be in a similar location on a, on a page for a similar vendor, right? And so we'll be able to use that bounding box as a feature. And so that actually took a lot of work because most OCR engines that are RESTful are not designed for you to, to basically slam them with millions of documents. So we did a bunch of weird work on that. But anyway, after that, we took that OCR result and we parsed it and we looked for anything that matched the thing that was keyed into SAP. So if I think about the total, we basically went in and we wrote um, some expressions to strip out things like commas and leading dollar signs and any trailing things and try to match that as a floating point number to the floating point number that was entered in SAP. And if we couldn't find any match, we threw it out. Right, And so that's assuming that either the OCR was bad or the keying into SAP was bad, but at any rate, if I can't find my target anywhere in my data set, it's not useful to me, you know what I mean? And so that's the extent to which we've done sort of like cleaning out the data is to say, hey, there's a problem, I don't know what the problem was. Some of the time it's with the OCR because it saw a thing that it thought was something else, right? Um, and some of the time it's with SAP, but honestly, you do it with millions of invoices and you still get millions of invoices, you know, even when you throw out all those weird er errata. And then we do our testing against real data though, right? And so we have people that enter invoices that we know is like known good data, and that's how we can kind of get our final accuracy, our validation accuracy. So I didn't hear all of the question, but I hope that answers. Is that, was that the gist of your question? Yeah. Okay. Any, any other questions? Yeah. Ends on what? Oh, yeah, so, so we don't do, that. that's their, is that their image recognition, like, yeah, as a service? Like OCR engine, built in as well. Yeah, so, so we would have consumed a service like Recognize. I think Recognize and the Azure Cognitive APIs would probably be reasonable competitors, right? Because Azure has APIs that you can just, like, give an image to and it'll say, oh, that's a horse, right, with a man on top, right? And, and so that's probably the reasonable analog. So what we did though is combine that with Spark. And so we basically wrote a Spark program that called out and it just loaded all these millions of documents and just made RESTful calls out to the API and got the JSON and saved it. Because that's how they reply is with JSON payload. And we, so we basically just parallelized across, I mean we stood up a bunch of these to run them serially because we kept hitting throughput limits. Um, so we just stood up more of them, you know. But anyway, that's, so we would, we would have used a service like that if we were on AWS as part of our pre-processing. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So we use, so Spark has a, has a set of libraries in ML lib is what they're called. Um, where they're distributed versions of, of just standard like li linear regression, logistic regression, k-means clustering, right? 
Those are implemented in MLlib, and they're implemented as parallel implementations, which means that they'll distribute across your cluster, right? As opposed to what you were doing in, you know, in, in scikit-learn, which obviously won't, right? Um, so what you find is with document classification, MLlib is probably pretty good because we still vectorize the data or we do like bag classifiers where we do counts of words, right? And so we look at the word prevalence in a document and then we send that to a logistic regression, we do classification on it. And we get pretty good results with that, right? But what you find is whenever you're saying, okay, well, now what I wanna do is send you an arbitrary number of words, which could be on some invoices, literally like 50 words, on some it's like 5,000, right? I wanna send you an arbitrary number of words and I want you to pick out a position in that, right? That's the, it, that's the total, that's the WBS number, right? And what you find is you can't really, we couldn't train a logistic regression model that was at all predictive, right? And so with logistic regression or with any of the other ML lib models that we tried, like Naive Bayes and other implementations, even whenever you combined them and ensembled them, which is something you have to do yourself because it's not supported out of the box, even when we ensembled them, we were still getting like 50%, but with TensorFlow and a deep neural network, we're above 95, right? With a, with a fairly trivial implementation of just a dense network or a recurrent neural network with one layer. Um, what we didn't try that does have a distributed implementation on TensorFlow, or on um, Databricks is uh, XGBoost. So you can do distributed XGBoost on, on, uh, with Spark, basically. And we didn't try that, frankly, because we, we just went to deep neural networks and we got great results after getting bad results with MLlib. But MLlib is great for other use cases. We use it for other use cases like uh, predicting failures of pumps and things like that based on tabular data. It works great for that. Sometimes you, you get a neural network out, right, and you're, you're basically just try decimating the data with the complexity of your network. And so it's definitely not the right place to start. Anyway, any other questions? Going once. Yeah. Well, so um, at Devon, we're going to get rid of our data center next year. Next year, we're going to get rid of our data center. And so we won't use it for anything. We'll be retiring it. Historically, we've used it for a lot of things. Um, and so we, we do CDH. We have Cloud Air's distribution of Hadoop. And uh, we got a lot of value out of Impala, actually, for very complex queries. And so people would say, well, what I want to do is I want to look at rolling averages by depth range in the whole Delaware Basin, right? And we tried to express that as a SQL query and it just wouldn't return, regardless of the size of the SQL server. We expressed that in Impala and it works great, right, in a couple minutes. And so we did things like that on our CDH cluster. We were also a big Datamere customer. Uh, we use Datamere a lot and what Datamere is, is basically like a, it's like an Excel kind of front end, but it compiles down to MapReduce code and it distributes what look like kind of Excel functions. So that was our other big use case. But what we're not as interested in moving to the cloud is, is infrastructure as a service solutions like CDH would be. Basically, we'd have to provision VMs, install Cloud Air on them, and then run a cluster, right? We're interested in platform as a service or software as a service. So Databricks is a PaaS where we, we, I don't care about version, right? I don't ever have to patch it. I don't have to do anything with VMs. I basically tell it to get me 40 nodes of this Databricks runtime, and it does it, right? Until I tell it to turn it off, and then it does that too, right? Um, with, with any of our like legacy, you know, with CDH, um, uh, e that we can't do that. They do have a product called Altus that they're working on that um, may, we just didn't need it. So, but yeah, we're moving all to Azure, so. Azure. Any other questions? Okay, well thanks. <laughs>